Welcome back to the actuality, Vizlay. My name is Zach, and I am your humble GM, otherwise known as Great Zamino. I use he, him pronouns, and I am uh, glad as heck to be back with all of my favorite cast members for our Invisible Sun RPG actual play, uh, The Hole in the World, uh, which is set in, of course, the world of uh, the Invisible Sun RPG by Monty Cook Games, to whom we are always grateful uh, for our uh, great, haunting, intense uh, role-playing actual play here. So uh, without further ado, I am going to ask that our cast members go ahead and introduce themselves for this, our kind of like little slowed down session, but we're going to be uh, we're gonna be covering some really cool ground in this world. Uh, let's go ahead and start off with Marcy. Hey, y'all. Uh, it's me, Marcy, a.k.a. Experimental Madness, which is still the name you can find me most places around the internet, except for Twitter, where I remain the resident cryptid and shell, but you can technically find me under the name Marciful. Um, I'm very excited to be back once again playing Gabrielle Glinsky, because we have to settle on her last name. <laughs> Um, and she is, of course, uh, the iconoclastic ardent apostate who hosts the choir. Excellent. And then moving down the overlay, Bill, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey, everybody. I'm Bill. You can find me on Discord. I am Ghost Bike over there. And I'm playing Maurice Webb, a stalwart empath of the Order of Weavers who turns tales into reality. Excellent. Uh, moving over to the other side, Hopper, if you want to introduce yourself. Can't tell me what to do. <laughs> um, I'm Hopper, and uh, as the GM, I think, I guess you can, but shh. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry about that. I'm me. Um, I can be found on the interwebs at failed deadly. That's with a three instead of an E because I'm a bad person. Um, I use they, them pronouns, as does my character. Um, and... Uh, I am playing uh, Okris, the iconoclastic ardent uh, apostate who heralds endings. Excellent. And finally, rounding out our motley crew, Marissa, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Marissa. She, her pronouns, also known as Critical Kitten, with a variety of punctuation here and there in various corners of the internet. Uh, and I play Kiri von Hollingsworth, who is the first assistant librarian of the Order of the Vance. She is an aromatic stoic who understands the words. Uh, and she's so far been pretty difficult these past couple of episodes, um, despite having Zaleska's grimoire and being its guardian, she nearly threw it into a fire last time. So not being a particularly good guardian at the moment. And yeah, that actually uh, brings to bear exactly just how much has transpired. Uh, last session was largely exposition, um, but uh, it was fairly necessary exposition as you guys found out some very important stuff, which I am going to recount as soon as I put on a little classic from uh, Kai Angle you guys might be familiar with. Oh, I love the idea of you as just the DJ. I was this just is another classic that. Kai Angle. <laughs> Everyone tuned, needs to do that now whenever kids. they're like changing up the, the, the songs on the playlist. Guys, just remember to keep your head in the sky and your feet on the ground. Um, so try All to... praise and Competech. <laughs> All praise and Competech. Um, so guys, uh, a lot has transpired. Uh, you guys got a lot of, uh, incredibly important answers from, uh, the, f uh, fairly familiar face, uh, that was recently familiar to you from your experience, uh, experiencing his, um, perspective through the war report. Uh, you found out that Kieran von Milas is, in fact, the Miller, uh, who is uh, one of, if not the de facto head of the Hendasa, a uh, secretive clandestine organization that tries to essentially uh, drag people out of uh, the illusory world of the Grey, the Shadow, in order to pull them back into the actuality, into the Indigo Sun. And uh, a lot of this is a continuation of a mission that uh, Kieran uh had in mind long ago after kind of collaborating ostensibly with the spider prince otherwise known as the younger version of maurice webb uh so you guys found out a lot of stuff namely you found out that um it ostensibly 
it was supposed to have been, or at least it was believed by Kieran that Okris uh, was responsible for the um, loss of memory that a lot of uh, the cataract experienced as they kind of undertook this new mission after a great spell was cast over the world, helping people to, uh, or helping people to forget the war, as it were. Uh, and basically, uh, Okris, uh, to Kieran, but was in fact, uh, Twig, uh, stole some of those memories and hid them away so that they could be found again. Uh, Kieran only became aware of a lot of the things that, uh, he used to know as soon as the Seed of Truth, uh, reemerged on the same sun that he was on in Fartown, um, when... Gabrielle uh, found herself back into this uh, uh, plane of existence following uh, their departure from uh, the war report. So a lot of the stuff uh, that Kieran was able to kind of do in order to bring you in secretively to try to draw less attention to all of you uh, was done with the help of a lot of these kind of powers that were at his disposal from uh, having the resources of the Hendasa available to him out of a place called the Oblong Chamber, where time essentially does not exist, Kieran is able to prolong uh, his experience of the actuality, and you realize that this took a toll on him as he grew more and more exhausted, uh, telling you of these kind of revelatory experiences. Uh, one such revelation you guys realized is that uh, were twofold. One was that um, Maurice was responsible for putting Gabrielle into a secondary kind of reality and not only that this secondary reality was the war-torn uh fields of saint P uh, petersburg russia i believe um so in addition to having that it was also revealed that maurice was single-handedly responsible to make uh for making sure that neither okris uh nor um uh Maduin, uh gabrielle's father uh, ha would anger the Warden of the Silver Sun by not appeasing him with a gift, um, which in this case, the forfeit for such a um, uh, a kind of uh, faux pas, as it were, uh, might have been fairly dire indeed. So uh, it was revealed that Maurice had a very distinct hand in um, how things turned out, or at least the Spider Prince did. Um, so after a lot and of just sorry, just to be clear, it, it was Okris nor Majuin, or was it Mott in this case? Uh, so Mott, you don't know about. Got it. Yeah, uh, but Majuin, well, you did not say that last time. Oh, you did not say that last time. What did I say last you time? You just didn't say anything. This is just new information in the recap. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I tried. To, I'm gonna stop. I'm. I'm trying to not. Um, I'm trying to leave a lot less subtext, a lot, because let me just tell you, I know authors that all use subtext and they're all cowards, every one of them. I um, mean, it's just one thing to be like, I'm nodding along, yep, the recap, yep, yep, yep. Here's new information. <laughs> I apologize. Gotta keep them on their toes. Argument, we had a Logavore incident and we just didn't realize it. Exactly. I like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I dwell in shadow all the time. I meet strange people, can't remember their faces. It's a weird thing. That might just be unique to me, though. Uh, <laughs> you should talk to a doctor about that. You know what? Let, we that is, we'll cross I that bridge when one. we get to it. Yeah. Um, that so, was a face journey too. No, <laughs> clip that. That was great. <laughs> um, so yeah, you guys found out a lot of uh, important information, and uh, when you uh, were kind of exhaust, you had asked all these exhaustive questions. Uh, you guys found yourself in. Uh, staying the night in uh, courtesy of the boarding facilities available to the Hendasa. Um, Maurice, you had a, a bit of a come to Jesus with uh, Kieran that uh, tempted you considerably. Um, you were asked if you were really uh, down with this whole resistance movement, this whole kind of uh, attempt or this desire for rebellion. And uh, he offered you, Kieran, a way to uh, go into the gray if you wanted to go. And so basically um, you denied that uh, that kind of offer and 
you decided to devote yourself to the cause of you and your you are friends and to Kieran's cause by proxy. Uh, in addition, uh, Gavrielle and uh, Kiri had a bit of a confrontation. Uh, Kiri expressing her frustration with the fact that the seed chose Gavrielle, uh, as well as uh, uh, Zaleska were able was able to spend those last precious moments with her before um, shattering and ostensibly going to the pale sun. So, um, in attempt to try to um, placate her. Uh, you asked a question of the universe, and the universe a uh, answered, and the seed of truth revealed to you the importance of uh, the Vance to indigo, if not to the whole of the actuality. Uh, that information flooded your mind while Kiri watched and did not uh, leave a good taste in her mouth. Uh, so much so that um, when she found herself... Um, by herself or, uh, or kind of functionally by herself with the assistance of Literalum, um, she almost burned Zaleska's grimoire. What would have happened? We don't know. But the only witnesses to this were Literalum as well as a single lone mirror that had somehow found its way into her chambers. Finally, Okris and Maurice you had a uh, confrontation wherein you realized that uh, you came to blows only because Maurice asked you to get it out of your system by some means or to go ahead and do it because it was something that clearly you wanted to do, Okris. Uh, and the ex the asked. kind of... He asked me to punch him. Yeah. It was, it was very... Go ahead, punch me, bro. Okay. Pu punch me, bro. Uh, what you gonna do? I don't do it. <laughs> and so it's, uh, it's it's the classic. What are you going to do? Stab me. <laughs> Says stab victim. <laughs> Says person who was subsequently stabbed. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, you uh, you uh, knocked uh, Maurice for a loop, or at least you thought you would. Um, it did significantly less damage uh, because Maurice used that uh, power to um, kind of uh, stop that uh, from uh, doing a crazy amount of damage. Uh, but in so doing, um, Maurice, you found around you, suffusing the tentacle, which has now book replaced your right hand, access to the hatred aggregate. You felt so close to it, you could almost reach out, grab it, and use it. But you didn't. And so the two of you found yourselves... Um, kind of in this detente, as it were, as you made your way to bed, I think worse for wear, regardless of how little damage was actually um, done. And so the following morning, you find yourselves in the oblong chamber, uh, staring across from Kieran von Milis, uh, the miller himself, who looked to you and said, so, what's the plan? And now, going to turn off this music and we are going to answer that question in earnest so I think Maurice looks around the room and says well I don't like to speak for everybody but here I go doing it anyway I think we would like to begin our journey in the Silver Sun. It's where I think many of our answers lie. It's where we might have the best shot of finding Mott and other members of the Cataract who we need to reunite as soon as possible. And Unless I miss something overnight. And he looks at everybody in the room. No, I'm, I'm just uh, impressed that somebody actually agreed with me. Kiri is leaning back in her chair, and she has a scowl on her face, but she says nothing. Okris, do you uh, say anything as well? Okris is uh, mirroring. Um, Okris is much more blank-faced, especially since they just... Did, did I get my new swag? Uh, I... Not quite. I. You know what? Actually, no, I will say this. Um, let's go ahead and wind back the clock a little bit. Uh, the following uh, morning after last... We're having a flashback. We are having a flashback. Uh, take one stress. 
Um, so, <laughs> uh, so earlier to that morning, you received a uh, long package, uh, uh, and inside of it, you found a, a great deal of uh, silver armor. Uh, kind of a breastplate as well as a uh, set of bracers and uh, matching gauntlets. Uh, and not only that, you had uh, found in it uh, a mask and just below all of these pieces, uh, lovingly assembled by the maker crew of um, Kirin, you found a uh, fairly hefty silver sledgehammer. Um, so my question is, what about this, uh, the accents of these armor piece, pieces uh, really kind of speak to you? What accents did the makers add themselves uh, that uh, set make this uh, armor kindled and unique? Is it possible to get a silver virus? Is that what's, is that what's going on to me? Is there like a silver virus along with mirror virus? I'm, I'm becoming concerned. I can no, actually, um, the, the system just doesn't allow for that. It's weird. This is the only thing Invisible Sun can't do. Yeah, I can. Hey, what was it? I can uh, I can give you silver poisoning. You could have blue skin. Uh, I can turn a card if you want. You can be that guy that like eats all the colloidal silver. Uh <laughs> I don't. I feel like I'm being offered a treat and I want to take it because I'm food motivated, but that treat also looks like it has razor blades in it. <laughs> oh, good God. Um, <laughs> sorry for that mental oh. image. Um, Always no, check your candy. No, don't, don't, I mean, yes, but also like, nobody's giving your kids free drugs, people. Calm the fuck down. They're giving them free razor That's blades. Like, free razor yeah. blades for when they're ready to shave. Okay, anyway. Let's not spread disinformation. <laughs> Anyways. Um, yeah, you I should guess... trust everything we say. Everything on this site is definitely newsworthy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Nothing um, but the facts. Nothing but well, the facts, ma'am. With our massive viewership, I'm sure we're, we're, uh, we're, we need to be concerned about spreading disinformation. Um, anyways, uh, so the, if it's, uh, yeah, silver armor, I think it's kind of a very, very tight, uh, very tight to the form. Kind of, it almost has more of the vibes of like a, um, a uh, body armor vest than it does like a traditional medieval breastplate. And um, these makers are extra. And I'm gonna say they're extra. Are they extra in a way that's intentionally annoying? or are they just extra to be extra? I'll uh, leave that to you, Zach. I, mm, extra to be extra. Can we turn a card to find out how extra I mean, the it's, it's, are? it's Hendasa makers. That's the thing. Yeah, I mean, they're fair. Well, you know what? They're like, we're saving the human race. Ooh. Well, you're lucky that you pulled it here. The tyrannical clock. Uh, oppression, time, countdown, schedule, repetition. We live and die quite literally by time. It rules our actions, for we have no actions without it. We struggle to accomplish what we must by a certain time. We face grim consequences. We eat, sleep, and even breathe, measured by the movements of the clock. It is our master. It is our enemy. And so this is, I think, interesting, because I think what this is, is... So the tyrannical clock is really something that speaks to um, the mindset of Kieran, Kieran being someone who manipulates time and space. And so there, I think that these makers have basically um, almost threaded them, these designs through uh, the silver and filigreed it in such a way to serve as a reminder to you how precious time is. Uh, so I'm gonna say this, uh, you are going to get plus one intellect, Bene, while you wear this. You are going to, however, get, uh, no, I think movement makes the most sense because time is of the essence. You are going to, however, uh, get minus one or one vex to, um, your intellect just because I think it's asking you to make hazardous uh, uh, questions or uh, hazardous, um, conclusions and to make, uh, jumps without a lot of forethought. Uh, so in this case, we'll call that um, uh, temporal uh, silver ar armor. So temporal make a note of that. Yeah. Temporal armor. Yeah. All right. Fucking mood. Uh, is the mask mask a mat matched set to that? It is. At the heart of it uh, is a clock, and you notice that 
uh, at the very top where both the hourglass or the hour hand and the minute hand meet. Uh, they are overlapping. Uh, they are meeting at a 13th hour, a note of the hour that Kieran lost. Ooh, mask of the 13th hour. Nice. Um, cool. Yeah, so the, um, Okris is glowering with just their eyes from behind this mask. Um, and uh, I, I think um, leaned up against, uh, leaned up against the wall or the oval walls of this chamber um and does it seems to be if not content to let Maurice speak um not offering anything better and just as once again kind of placed themselves in such a way that they're closer to Kieran um keeping everybody else within eyesight absolutely and I think um Kiri I will say that it is not so much a slight this armor, this kind of mask, so much as it is a reminder that there is not much left of the friend that you knew that you can see. We did just Darth Vader. We did just pull a Darth Vader on you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's actually a reverse Darth Vader. Well, no, it is. A, it's an actual Darth Vader and also a wow. reverse Darth Vader. Reverse Darth Vader is such an interesting mm -hmm. concept. Just exactly. Yeah, you're my, you're yeah. my daddy now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep this PG, okay? <laughs> Whatever you do, kids, just don't go to Urban Dictionary and look up Reverse Darth Vader, okay? <laughs> yeah, please don't. No. Oh God. Um, so I think, uh, uh, I think Maurice uh, kind of looks at, at Gav, having you know expressed surprise that anyone would agree with her plan and says uh i do have a few things i'd like to do in Saturnina. after all it's been nine months um i just you know want to wrap up a few things i imagine other people would as well and uh i think at which point um kieran looks at all of you and says does he speak for you all then? That you all need things that you have to do. Do you need to get them done now? Time, while we have so much of it here, it's fleeting. So, bear this in mind. But all I think Curious at the top. I'm not going anywhere until I find out what's happened to the Vance. Very well. That makes, that is understandable. And he looks at Gabrielle and Ogris. Are there anything that either of the two of you need that otherwise we're happy to put you up for board here? Oh, that won't be necessary. I have a place of my own that I should probably check on. Very well. Ogris. trying to remember what voice I do. Um, I need to speak to you privately. It's low-key Batman. <laughs> <laughs> the thing you have to talk about is low-key Batman? Or the no, 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 the voice Batman. is low-key Batman. Casual Friday Batman. <laughs> Casu casual Friday. It's Batman. It's the bat flops. Oh, you know, bat you. flops, bat shorts, and... Uh, bat jeans. Bat jeans. Yeah, I just want to say swear to me now. But I, anyway, I'm not going to create that circumstance. Um, he well, looks. I'll, I'll, I'll work it in there somewhere. <laughs> Good job, everyone. We're not even an hour in. We've got Reverse Vader and <laughs> Casual Friday <laughs> Batman. <laughs> Casual Friday Batman. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, swear to this, my tie. Oh, I don't God. know. Yeah. Anyway. Uh <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, don't mind me. So yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, Chris just kind of looks uh, looks over and back at Kieran. I need to speak to you privately. And Kieran nods. So, as I said, time is fleeting, and I am having I'm all over the place with Kieran's voice. So please forgive me. Um, I think he's a little British, right? Yeah, he's very British, right? Yeah. Tinker Taylor Soldier. Charles Dance. Mm -hmm. Charles, Charles Dance. Dance. Oh, oh, wow. Okay. Man, that's big shoes to fill. Okay. Um, 
At which point, uh, he just looks at all of you and just says, Um, very well. How much time do we need to have before we meet again? How much time do you need, I should say? Maurice looks at Kiri, makes uncomfortable eye contact as she returns it. I think she resists this as long as absolutely possible until it's clear, like, the entire table is sitting there looking at her. And she finally, like, very recalcitrantly looks up, like, defiantly, like, don't look at me, don't perceive me. (laughs) Um, And uh, then goes, I can't give you an estimate. I'm going to get to the bottom of what's happening at the Vance. I expect a week Maybe I have to track down Yenavastra. I have to figure out what's happening with the new order. It could take time, but I can't put a deadline on it. Very well, just bear this in mind. And um, he looks to the rest. He looks at you, Maurice, and he says, um, he also looks to all of you, says, also, if there is anything that I can do to perhaps train you in advance of this journey to provide whatever meager resources I have available. I can do such a thing. And um, he is essentially offering you guys uh, to teach you guys secrets uh, if you have some downtime that you would like to spend with him. Um, The last thing he does, though, is he looks at you, uh, Maurice, and says... I assume a week is enough for what you need to accomplish. Do you need any, any of you need any sort of Hendasa escort? (laughs) That won't be necessary. No, I'll be fine. Very well. Those of you who would like to stay, stay. Otherwise, I will see you here in a week, whatever that is. And uh, he waits to kind of usher everybody out, uh, at which point I think Okris, if you would like, I believe you may have that scene with Kieran. Yeah, so um, once everybody else leaves, um, I think you see Okris definitely relax slightly as much as you've ever seen them relax, Um, or at least not look like they're about to do imminent violence. Um, it's more, yeah, it's more of a ratcheting down of the imminentness. Okay. Imminentness. Imminentness. Yeah. yeah. Imminent, <laughs> anonymity. <laughs> Anem, um, anim, anim, anyway, onomatopoeia. Let's go. All right, dear God. Uh, of violence. Um, and so Ogris just kind of, uh, I may need your assistance. I am at your disposal. You may recall the last time we were together. I, um, and, uh, can we just say this breastplate has a quick release? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Otherwise, it's a, we get a long montage of ochre stripping <laughs> off armor. Um, hold on. Hold, hold on. <laughs> oh, hold on. <laughs> um, so ochre's like kind of, uh, um, like kind of, unhinges or unsnaps um, this bre- breast uh, this breastplate kind of revealing just uh, like a plain black shitty shirt um, and pulls it down revealing what appears to be like these grubby blood stained um, bandages just old old and new blood layered one on top of the other the dark dark rusty browns of st- um, st- older stains and the bright red of more recent stains uh, with black running all, all throughout it's this really messy patchwork um, and uh Nogris just kind of jams a couple fingers into this big wound and just goes, I'm missing a couple things. Uh, And I think uh, there is kind of a, if there were a bemused expression or like maybe an apprehensive one on uh, his face, he doesn't show it. Uh, Instead, what he does is uh, a small side table rises from the um, perfect white of the irid- uh, of the oblong chamber uh, 
and it seems that whatever this um, side table is, it has a hinge on it uh, and a small seam, and he flicks open uh, what looks to be a small receptacle, and he pulls from it a set of goggles uh, that he puts on, uh, and you watch as the... um, Kind of the circular obular, uh, orb-like lenses of the uh, goggles flick on, turning red, and you feel the temperature or the uh, kind of the ambient coldness of the uh, uh, the um, heat of the chamber drop uh, about ten or twenty degrees. Uh, as I think you recognize an implement that uh, Kieran used while he was uh, working for the cataract, uh, as he then immediately um, takes from his pocket uh, a sense of kind of like almost like knitting needles that are stainless steel and very kind of polished and uh, he gently kind of looking to you for approval um, motions as if to put the needles into the wound as if to spread uh, the flaps apart and Chris Chris gives like a kind of get on with it hand gesture yeah uh, he opens it, and I'm going to turn a card to see if there's any um, depletion of this item. Probably should include a medical yeah. tag, trigger warning. Yeah, uh, yeah, guys, uh, so uh, just for anybody that's a little bit squeamish, I'm going to go ahead and uh, keep this fairly brief. The card that I drew, however, is the Revolutionary, which is the Sovereign of Secrets, Ravens, Books, and Flame. Um, Whose Sovereign is that? Twigs. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's good to know. Uh, Let me go ahead and read this card in terms of the Sovereign of the Family of Secrets. The Revolutionary is a force for change, quite possibly the least secret of the family. The revolutionary is brazen and bold, changing what needs changing even through violence or destruction. The strong sexuality of the revolutionary is obvious, but this aspect is quite separate from the other. There is no suggestion of sexual violence here, but instead sincere passion, mutual attraction. Um, Okay. Something changes radically or is destroyed. Could be a person or an object, but just as likely an institutional law or something similar. Um, Conditions change in the favor of the NP of the PC. Uh, He changed everything and looked damn good doing it. Uh, I love that card. Okay. So. He takes a look. And I think what the revolutionary suggests is that um, Twig's handiwork or Twig, whatever evidence uh, uh, that has transpired, um, it's all over the place. It doesn't need to have been hidden. Um, And... There are a few things with pulling a sovereign card that Kieran realizes, which is he uh, looks up at you, um, pulls back the uh, lenses, kind of flicks them up so that his eyes are looking at you still while these goggles are emitting this intense cold and rime is beginning to form on the skin of his cheeks. He looks up at you and says, so... You're not quite Vizle, are you? That's a very personal question. And uh, he looks at you and he says, um, I actually see a bit of a demon in here, but there's no hierarchy, no order, no rank. So you're not that either. But... You're also clearly not an angel or some other creature. Seem to be some mix of things. And by the look of it, your status, whatever ambiguity it is, it represents, has given your counterpart the ability to pull this heart out of your chest without you having a bit of a fall down. I had picked that bit up from the fact that I'm walking around. And uh, he looks at you and says, this is very powerful magic indeed. I think it's one thing you understand 
to die and come back from the dead or to reanimate anything. To create something that can incessantly move forward regardless of one of its most important constituent pieces being missing. Ah, that's a lot of power. If I was, if it was a different time, I would have asked Ordo Rem to let me study you at length, but since time is of the essence, I think I might have something that can help. Now, I don't know where this heart of yours is. But I have something that can help you and your friends. Ogris just holds up, uh... Okay. Two, two hearts, two. Very well. Stranger things. Um, and he pulls up a, uh, small kind of box uh, from that same receptacle and opens it and inside of it is a compass with a um, what it looks to be are six cardinal directions and he looks at you and he says this is a multiphasic compass they're very rare but I've made a bit of an adjustment normally a multiphasic compass it tells you along six cardinal directions basically where your current coordinates are however what I have done is I've given this a little bit of extra kick to it as it were a little bit of extra functionality all you need do is specify what you need to find and it will point you in the direction of where you need to go. Now, it's interesting in that it works a little bit less directly. It points you to things that may be instrumental in getting to the objective of where you need to be. It's not direct. Nevertheless, what little this can help you could save you tremendous amounts of time. And he looks at you very seriously and very level-eyed, unwavering, and as the rhyme continues to form on his cheeks, he does not waver, he does not blink, and he says, this is something that all of your companions will need. I am giving this to you now because you've expressed the need. This is not just for you. I trust them, and you should as well. Understood? It's a bargain. Uh, And he gives you the multiphasic compass, and mark that in your inventory. I will uh, text you the description of what it does. Yeah. Uh, do you have any other questions for him? Yeah, nothing important. Uh, at which point we are going to cut there. And I'm going to change the music. Uh, who'd like to go next? I think Maurice runs after Kiri a little bit as they leave the room and kind of catches her on the shoulder and says, uh, hey, um, can I talk to you for a second? I think she turns around and her face is composed in a very sort of Allegra-esque expression, very terse and in some ways blank, in some ways kind of missing the usual emotions that dance so plainly on Kiri's face. Um, She turns to you, make it quick. Oh, we can walk and talk. Come, I, um, look, I know that we all have business to attend to and um you know i know we're all doing what we think is right i all this just to say no one's leaving you i'm i'm still here for you and 
I'll be in our dream study every night. Um, if you, you said need. anything about leaving. I mean, you're going to the Vancing campus. I'm going elsewhere. Gav is going to her home, I guess. We are reconvening, and that's all. It's a, it's a small break. It's uh, all I'm saying. Yes, I understand what it is to go and finish some individual business, Maurice. I don't you know where to find me. I suppose where you've always been, you've made that clear. I haven't always been there. I want to just make clear that I will be. Well, I appreciate the offer. Thank you so much for extending it. And I assure you, should I need to converse about anything, I can find you in our dream study. She smiles a little like forced false smile. And uh, Maurice kind of sits there for a minute and says, um, kind of quietly, it's not an offer. Oh? I'm telling you what I'm doing. The offer... <sighs> you know where to find me. It's not an invitation. It's a promise. And when you're ready to get over yourself, I'll be there. And he walks past you. She bristles at this. And I think she has a retort on her lips that she's about to shout after you, but you see her close her mouth very firmly in a tight line and turn on heel. As Maurice walks out the door of the acclimation center, he reaches up to his face and removes it uh, and puts it in his pocket. The face, his eyes and nose and mouth are kind of dripping blood from this thing. He puts it in his pocket and kind of like as a, at a space where he could see at like waist length and uh, walks out with a just complete blank face using uh, this incantation called the thrill of independence is not lost. So, yeah, please go ahead. Um, and uh, he begins walking to the um, to the square with the um, war memorial, the statue of General Nehemiah. Excellent. Okay. So you are making your way to the cluster of cloisters then. Okay. Cool, 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 cool. Um, so uh, before we uh, go and uh, kind of join you back to that uh, process, uh, does anybody have uh, anything else they want to accomplish right now at this day? Uh, yeah. Is um, ha Has Okris left yet? Have you, Okris? No. Okay. Um, I think Gav might might go find Okris mm -hmm. as uh, she's heading off. Um, and uh, <laughs> just walk over to them and uh, give like a very like awkward hand wave and uh, say, "Do you want to start over?" Is that an offer or a threat? Oh, trust me. When I threaten people, I'm usually pointing my gun at their face. Fair. I'm walking back to uh, my house if you want to join me. Why? I think there is something there that you might be uh, interested in seeing. Well, I don't have anything better to do, so... All right. Well, come with me and I'll, uh, I'll fill you in on, uh, on who I am along the way. Um, and, uh, you can, you can feel free to, like, cut away from there because I think there's, we're gonna do, I'm gonna do a little montage thing here as, like, they're, they're uh, heading towards, uh, the ruined expanse. Uh, Gav is basically essentially going to give you a 
a montage of who she is, how she got there, and all that good, good stuff from part one. If you want to know what she's talking about, you got to go back and watch <laughs> all those videos. The more you know. Yeah, please, please do that. Please do that. Um, okay. Uh, we're going to cut away from there. Uh, Kiri, where are you off to as um, they are catching up? Um, I think Kiri makes a beeline for the Vancian campus. Um, but before she does, was Kieran able to get any additional information about Yadavastra's location? Because I know Kieran said last time that like he was going to potentially look into it and let her know before they left if there was anything that could be found. I am going to turn a card, see how well he does, and I will give you an idea of where that could be. The card I pulled is Enveloping Darkness. Its color is invisible. Uh, mysteries, rats, mirrors, and stone. Meanings, restriction, loss, and endings. Dark isn't an absence of light. Light is an absence of darkness. Darkness is the default. It moves in to fill any place the light abandons. The dark was the totality of the actuality before the suns existed. And according to many, the dark will be the totality again once the suns are gone. The darkness is the end. It takes things. It takes us. It grabs, constricts, and overwhelms everything not warded by the light. The enveloping darkness pretends an ending. Something draws quickly to a close. Endings aren't always bad, though. So this card turn can bring relief as an affliction or problem comes to an end. The card can also mean restriction or denial. The tendrils of the enveloping darkness can hold us fast and keep us from doing what we want. An end to freedom, so to speak. The card does not suggest death for the person in question, but it can suggest the death of someone involved in the matter at hand. Something significant happens or will happen at night. An NPC dies, an important object is lost, people are trapped or otherwise prevented from moving freely. Okay. Uh... Something hinders or restricts the PC's movement. An NPC close to the PC dies. He was so afraid of the darkness beneath his bed, he neglected the darkness outside of his window. Okay. So, what I am going to interpret this is, and your desire was to see, um, was to learn more about Yadavastra's whereabouts instead of what was going on at the campus. So, I think that, um, I think that what... Kieran is able to come back to you with um, is he kind of because of the middling number of the card about six um, his color is invisible the color of protection and it looks at you uh, he looks at you and I think um, or he doesn't look at you I think he gives you a note um, that's handwritten uh, collecting uh, kind of m making a collection of notes as to his research um, uh, and he just, I think the note reads, was unable to find Yadavastra's exact whereabouts, did some research uh, with several operatives in the field, discovered that current um, uh, residence is located in Fartown, um, frequently makes trips to Quiet Lake and to the Palindrome. And those are kind of like the notes that Kieran has left you. Okay. Um, I think because Kiri doesn't know how safe the campus is at the moment, given what she's heard about what's going on, she wants to find Yadavastra first. Um, so I think, is does Kieran's note give a sense of like, which of these three places seems to be most likely? Or it's just sort of like, Good luck. Here are your three options. Choose well. I think that there is an exact address last attached to Yadavastra in Fartown. Uh, right. Quiet Lake, there are a couple of known haunts, um, um, but otherwise nothing very specific. Uh, with regard to the palindrome, there's also nothing very specific. Again, a couple of places that uh, they are known to frequent. Okay. I think based on that information, Kiri will go to the exact address that she has um, and start there. 
Uh, also, uh, let's go ahead and say hey to our Raiders. Uh, hey, Krifu, thanks so much for joining us. We're so glad to have you. We're doing a little bit of our downtime kind of session as uh, we try to learn more answers to pressing questions. So thanks again. Um, so, Kiri, you were heading to Fartown, I believe, right? Okay. Uh, so you were going straight to uh, the Vancing campus or to um, their residence. What do you do? To their residence, um, I think, until she knows more from Yadavastra about what's happening on the campus, she doesn't want to brave or potentially bring the grim Grimoire back into a circumstance where it could be in danger. Cool. Okay. Um, so I will go ahead and say that uh, the residence in uh, Fartown, and let me go ahead and pull up my um, map in my uh, documents over here. So... Uh, I think that the place you're going is not very far from, um, from the campus itself. Uh, the, uh, the place that it is, uh, marked as is, I believe, uh, 238, uh, Wittershins Street. Uh, it is on the, I want to say the south, uh, the southern, central southern, uh, side of, uh, Fartown very close to the bleed where the edges of Fartown meet the kind of barrier that has been erected around um, the uh, around the district. Uh, so you get there fairly easily enough. And let me put on some different music uh, as you venture in. So, the address takes you to a small abandoned lot um, that there is, it seems fairly unkempt with the exception that there is a corner bookstore um, not too far uh, off to one side. That's more of like kind of like a local newsstand. It's almost like a communal library. Um, this communal library uh, just has a very large receptacle to one side and a fairly uh, gregarious looking um, uh, older woman manning the till, as it were. Um, basically, all behind her are a number of books that are chained uh, to the back just for the sake of uh, convenience and perusal. Um, but there are just numerous volumes in front of her. Uh, and she uh, looks to you and says, um, Hello. Welcome to the uh, musings and meanderings. Can I help you? And on, I will say this, on Kieran's note is a title uh, that says um, Cartographies of the Heart. I think Kiri will have especially if it is capitalized as such, have interpreted this as a book title. Um, and so she puts on her sort of mask of being socially acceptable in public uh, and smiles slightly. Uh, good day. Uh, yes, I I am looking for a book. Um, and she, she shows, or at least she says the title, The Anomalies of the Heart. And... There is a look where she kind of, this uh, older um, matronly woman looks down at you. Um, she's fairly uh, corpulent, very, um, but just very happy as she kind of like looks at you and she kind of looks at you sidelong a little bit. And uh, she, after a moment of kind of careful study of you, looks and she says, well, I know you're a Vance. You must be one of Yadavastra's friends, then. Yes, yes, I am one of Yadavastra's friends. Um, do you... Could, could you tell her I'm here? Well, just a moment. I don't see why not. But uh, mind you, they very much value their privacy. And so don't expect me to go ahead and let you uh, uh, in for just... Whoever, it's got to come from them. Uh, of course, of course. Um, could you tell them that the Kiriel von Hollingsworth is here? Well, I can do that. Uh, well, can you do me a favor? Buy me one of these penny novels over here. I'm having a yes. hard time moving them. Uh, of course. Um, and she 
like goes over to where she's been instructed to be. Where would you like me to put them? Oh, I, I'm hoping you could take them off my hands. Nobody else is picking them up. Oh, oh I see. You you want me to, to buy them? Yes. I'm afraid I don't. She, like, rummages around in her pockets. Um, Actually... You, uh, you should recall, uh, or not should recall, I will say that um, uh, you do have, still have quite a great deal of currency from uh, King Nine. Uh, cool. She didn't even remember that she had any of this. So she's like, um, h- how much do you, what do they cost? And uh, are you, are you pulling out like gem orbs while you're doing this? Yes. And a- as you do that, she just like, I think a deft set of fingers picks up uh, one of the gem orbs. This should be fun. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she said, so how many do you want? Or do you want the whole lot? Um, well, I ha- haven't brought a receptacle to carry them, but I however many that you are looking to be rid of, I suppose. And she, and she looks, well, I've got I've got just the thing. And she uh, grabs a tote bag uh, that is behind her uh, of uh, uh, musings and meanderings. And uh, she just starts uh, shuffling a bunch of these books in. And you recognize some of them as uh, mysteries uh, about Basil Cotton the Vizlay detective as she's beginning to shovel them in and there doesn't seem to be a bottom to this tote bag as you realize she is giving you a bottomless um, book bag Um, uh, only good for the carrying of large amounts of books and I was just about to ask that question can we use it for other things or is it just for books and also can I get that in reality uh, I mean honestly and as she hands it to you it only here only in the actuality but um she hands you this tote and uh it weighs no more than a single trade paperback and uh she turns around and uh says uh and just before I go ahead and get them you just let I just want to let you know you're welcome to anything in the shop any time you want. Oh. Uh, would I have to pay for that as well? Oh no, you've paid. You've paid considerably. And uh <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> and I think you perks. bought this bookstore. Kiri <laughs> <laughs> now is the proud owner of um, using some meanderings. Uh and uh and she turns around and um you uh i think that she kind of goes out of eye shot of you uh you hear uh, a little bit of rustling and then you hear uh madam uh, 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 uh ma- madam miss uh, mass uh, yet avastra i've got a friend here for you says her name's kiri von hollingsworth you want me to uh, okay all right and um, you hear the slam of a book, and uh, a, pretty soon she reappears, and she has uh, this book, Cartographies of the Heart, out in front of her, and she pushes it to you and says, well, um, you just go ahead and open that, and uh, uh, when you're ready to come out, you just give me a knock, three knocks. I'm sorry, y- Yadavastra is... In the... Oh, yeah, plenty of viz they make their homes in books. They love them. Oh. Saves on quite a deal of space, if you ask me. There is that. There is also the mobility. People can carry your home around. I've read a couple of books about people doing it, but I can't say that I've ever seen one. And suddenly she's animated by, like, this very you haven't seen this from Kieran quite a while but like a very curious like a curiousness uh, and an intellectual invigoration and she like is examining this book wow and so I just opened the cover oh yeah absolutely you just opened the cover uh, uh oh Abigail here put that in the back and uh, make sure you guys aren't disturbed and uh you just give me a knock I'll open it back up and you can uh land right where you are right just now I'm I'm looking forward to this. Thank you. Um, y- you said your name was? Uh, Abigail. Abigail. Uh, I am the Abigail. proprietress, as it were. Uh, 
and a very good proprietress indeed. Oh, thank, thank you. you. And she'll uh, head towards the back to enter the book in which Yadavastra has been hiding. And she uh, opens kind of like this uh, uh, wooden bar over to one side, hinging it up. Uh, you walk past her, past this kind of newsstand communal library, which you have uh, uh, purchased a considerable share of. Uh, and there is a small side uh, kind of table on which you can rest this uh, book and uh, transport yourself. Okay. As you open the book, uh, you... I think it's almost like a sharp inhalation of breath. as, And you find yourself standing in front of a modest uh but very um very comfortable looking home with a carefully uh tended garden what about this house do you see makes you realize that it is the home of advance what is the first manifestation of this fastidiousness and this uh understanding of magic um it's the fact that there are spiral staircases on the outside of this building um, at which you can, and it, clearly it goes sort of up to the top, one on each side, uh, climbing the house, almost like fire escapes, but clearly built into the designed architecture of the landscape. Um, and in, around, in and around each of these uh, spiral staircases, there are these manicured, carefully manicured gardens, um, hedgerows that are clipped to exactitude, uh, sculptures that are shaped, many of them in the form of books or in artifacts uh, that you would recognize from fancy and studies, uh, like, you know, principles, things that are, um, like close to principles of physics, um, quantum mechanics, as insofar as you can clip a hedgerow to look like something in quantum mechanics, it has been done here. Um, and so I think instantaneously someone walking into this home would know, like, this is the home of someone not only who is advanced, but who seems to be relatively high up in the order, um, especially as some of these hedgerows and sculptures have been clipped into kind of advanced principles. And I think that you notice uh, as uh, you're kind of taking this in, uh, there is a widow's walk at the very top of this house, uh, at which point you can see uh, sitting in her silver greaved chair, or their silver greaved chair rather, is Yadavastra. Um, and as I take it, you would begin assuming uh, you see them uh, in this position, you would begin uh, ascending the uh, stairs. Uh, Definitely. You, you begin walking up the stairs, and as you do, you realize that each one of them has a little hinge on it, as though at any point it could uh, turn into a slightly declined rail uh, to give Yadavastra different uh, access to the different levels of each of their home. And you begin ascending, and I think sitting at the very uh, center of the widow's walk, um, sipping a cup of tea very um, thoughtfully, is Yadavastra. Yadavastra, uh, I'm so glad to see you. And she hurries up to her, or to, hurries up to them. And as you hurry up to them, um, there is this kind of happy but melancholy look on their face um, as though they are trying to decide on an emotion. And Mistress Von Hollingsworth, so good to see you again after so long. I will confess that I was somewhat worried, but certain that I would see you again soon. Yes, I... Oh, I have so much to tell you, Yadavastra. There's... The war report, we we found it. We went into it. It was amazing. So, Celeska was successful then. Wait, you, you knew that that's what it was? Um, it's hard to say what I remember or know. 
anymore. I know that things... Seleska had projects and stratagems and... Many of them had to do with the war, and the more I learned, the more I forgot. I assume I won't remember much of anything we discuss, but as it pertains to the war. Yes, I get the impression there's some sort of magic that's keeping this knowledge from the people of Saturine, and only those that have been in the war report, or, well, those who are close to something else, only they can remember. Oh? Yes. Um, what do you... What do you know about a seed of truth? <sighs> a seed of truth. And I'm going to turn a card. Weeping Priest, the Apprentice of Secrets, Ravens, Books, and Flame. Meanings, betrayal, weakness, turnabout, disillusionment, and loss. The priest sits alone, filled with sadness or remorse. What has happened? What's causing his misery? Happiness, success, and good fortune are fragile things, easily taken away by the cruel hand of fate. This is particularly true when there's a probably unseen weakness in a plan. As the apprentice of the Secrets family, the Weeping Priest is its weak link, its hindrance, a hindrance at best and a hidden stab in the back at worst. The worst secret of all is one that conceals betrayal by the one you love most. The Weeping Priest is almost always an unwelcome card. It indicates a surprise reversal and it's almost always bad. It suggests that there's an unexpected weakness in the plan to deal with the matter at hand. An NPC changes their mind about something. Something is lost. Do I weep most for the wrongs I have witnessed or those I have committed? I'd like you to make me an interaction roll. Absolutely. And I will add a bene to that. Um, six plus one, seven. Um... There is something, I think, at work behind their mind as they look at you. And I think that when they tell you, I don't know specifically what a seed of truth is. I can guess to its function somewhat. Tell me more. It's this glowing orb-like thing it it resides within a single vislay it attunes to them and when it does it well they can ask the universe anything any knowledge in the entire actuality and it will answer that's a powerful object or artifact to have it was Zaleska's. I, I met Zaleska. You met Zaleska? She was alive after all this time. She preserved herself in the war report, and she had a seed of truth. I wouldn't put it past her to have access to such things, but the Zaleska I knew, she always made a big show of the importance of research and the importance of study. I don't, I don't think she could have ever asked a single question, gotten all the answers. She put in too much work. That's what I thought too. I, I don't know how she came to have it or why, um, but she gave it to someone else who was there in the war report, too. So they have it now. Okay. Is this someone you trust? Is is this someone that we need to involve with the Vance, perhaps? Um, the Parasad, the Veshtad? No, no, I... No. Um, she wouldn't like that 
at all. Um, no, I... I suppose I'm only asking you this, knowing that you will forget it soon. Because I wonder... Would Zaleska... Why would Zaleska not have given the Seed of Truth to advance? When there was one who could receive it. And she looks at you long and hard. And she says, I believe wholeheartedly in the Vance, in the Our Order. I believe strongly in the achievements it's been able to accumulate to the discoveries that the Vance have made are so paramount to the actuality as a whole. Are you so certain, however, that Zaleska was infallible? Because... What? But of course she would be. She's Zaleska. She's, she's the hero of the Vance. She's been the light at the top of the pillar of knowledge and and truth and everything the Vance stands for. Zaleska's she her hand just instantan like instinctually goes to the grimoire. Her knowledge is is everything. And I know that the Vants are not perfect. I I did not trust the woman they chose to succeed me, for instance. I worry that she is too much of a political animal, but I respected the desires of the Order. I respected that I was unable to protect those people under my charge. Just as the Vance of yore, enough experimentation, reckless and with great abandon, took place that Orod, the best of us, had to sacrifice his life to safeguard not only the rest of the Vance that had committed this terrible, grievously irresponsible act, but to also safeguard the rest of the actuality. Does that suggest that any of us could be infallible? No, I suppose not, but but this is Zaleska we're talking about. She, I saw what she did in the war, who she was, and how she commanded armies, how she strategized, how she seemed to know what was coming, and how she handled it, how she dealt with it. Her decision-making was was spotless, sparkling. I don't think I saw her make a wrong decision. And, um, the Adavastra in this very rare, even you pick up on it, very dis rare display of sentiment, reaches their hands out to take yours. And I think Kiri will, will take it. This is who she considers to be the head of her organization. And they take your hands. Um, I'd like you to make me a perception roll. Sure. Um, that's a five. I think there is an unexpected uh, bit of warmth that passes between the two of your uh, sets of hands. And they look at you. And they say, I know that if it had been up to Zaleska, she would have made the wisest decision available. And yet, I cannot think of anyone I would rather put such an artifact into the care of than you. It's why I trusted you with that grimoire. Because I know 
I know that you would never do anything to put it at risk and that you would safeguard it with your life. A flash of guilt, barely perceptible, flicks through Kiri's eyes. And so, it yeah. means a lot to me to hear you say that, Yadavastra. Of course, it's, it's sincere. I hope that it's very clear how sincere, how important you are to the Vance as a whole. How important to your colleagues, to Ardeno, to the a tremendous amount of work that you did on your research for the Library of Esoteric Studies. It's... I... I cannot imagine someone being infallible who would not be able to see what I see. I think when Kiri looks up, there's like briefest glimmer of tears in her eyes. Does every Vance doubt their path like this? Some doubt. Some... <sighs> Some, like your sister, have too much surety. Every... Yes, I saw that. <laughs> Every path. She was everywhere in the war report. She was. Huh. She did so much. Maybe she is more complicated than I give her credit. More complicated or something else. I didn't say that I thought everything she did in it was good. Certainly, some of it a long way from that. I don't know if I can answer that or speak to that. Maybe the best thing to do is to have her speak to it herself in a way. We will find her. I promise you that. That's. I've. I've promised a number of people that. I will help with, we'll locate her. Um, but I don't, I don't want to take up too much of your time yet, Avastra. I just, and I'm sorry to come with all of this, with all of this news, given the circumstances, but, and I'm sorry if this is hard for you in some way, but I need to know what happened at the Vance, the murders, everything that I heard coming out of the war report. What's going on? I will endeavor to do the best I can to tell you, but um, maybe as it pertains to your sister, this can provide a means by which you can learn more. And they place their hand over about one, two feet above a side table uh, on which uh, they have rested their tea. And they begin gesturing, and a small box appears um, on the table adjacent to the tea saucer. And they open it up, and in the center of this box is a copper icon that resembles a brass, or a resembles a palace. And they push it to you. And they say, I have had this for quite some time. And I think that that was by your sister's design before she chose to traverse the path that she has. And I hope it proves useful to you in your search. And you now have access to your sister's mind palace. And it's there we're going to take our 10 minute break. Way, we are so, going to go ahead and start back with Gabrielle and Okris. And let me put on some music. All right. 
Gavrielle, where are you leading Ocris? Uh, Gavrielle is going back, uh, you know, traipsing her way back to the ruined expanse where the last place that she saw her lair was. Um, and, you know, considering that it's an old abandoned building, I don't think she thinks it's gone anywhere. <laughs> so you can tell me if it's still there or not. Uh, I will not tell you. The cards will tell us. Oh, dear. Let's see how it goes. It's fine. Fleeting moment. Lost time, elusiveness, agility, and reaction. Time moves inexorably forward. Sometimes it moves so quickly that we will lose track of it. We try to watch, we try to pay attention, and yet it's gone. Mercurially, it slips through our fingers. Time can move so rapidly. In fact, that we can lose time. Look at the clock. It's 622. Look again, seemingly a moment later, and it's 805. They say that there was once an hour that came after midnight, but eventually it moves so quickly that it has disappeared altogether. If that's true, perhaps it's the fate of all time, and the midnight hour will flit away next. Time is elusive and impossible to hold, no matter how you try. It's a force of e uh, that even the gods fear. And this is uh, strengthening indigo magic. It weakens gray magic. Um, quick and decisive reaction is the advice suggested by this card. The implication is that something is going to happen. It's going to happen soon and it's going to happen fast. One must be ready. This could be a threat or it could be a valuable opportunity. Either way, one has to react to it with agility, physical, mental, or both, or this elusive vent will flitter away, leaving only its results behind to show that it ever even happened. Time passes suddenly. Something strange happens with time or the perception of time. An NPC escapes from confinement. An elusive figure, perhaps a spirit or legendary be be beast, makes a brief appearance. An NPC force, uh, performs a feat of amazing agility. Blink and it's gone. A moment too quick to perceive, but your whole life is made of such moments. Okay. So what I will tell you this is that there is... The building is still standing as you make your way to the expanse. Um, it is um, very clearly been nine months, however, and I think that there is more kind of uh, growth around the spot. I think, never mind, this is a ruined expanse. There's not much growth of anything, but I think there's still been some degradations to time itself. I think some of the... Um, edifices around it look more worse for wear or look as if they've been decimated by the passage of time or by gravity and uh i think as you guys are moving you spot something in an alley not far away and i think that you see a a kind of gloomy figure on standing on two long hands and a torso uh has its torso has been bisected um it's just massive face glowering at you two bright eyes peering out of uh shadow spiraling horns um circling around its pointed ears and you see it leap up onto one hand and point at you it should be said that this bisected torso doesn't seem to have any gore or any kind of like um, any kind of uh, uh, attachment, anything, uh, any viscera attached to it. Um, but you see it pointing at you. Um, oh, Chris, how much time did you spend in Saturine? Not much. I will tell you this. We I mean, not much over percentage wise, not much. Um, I will say this, um, the two of you, because you are apostates, can make, uh, me, um, rolls for magical lore that is not of, you know, kind of, uh, it's kind of esoteric lore. Um, oh, so cool. I think each of you get, like, one to that. We, I do, at the very least. I, see I do there. as well, because of apostate. Can yep. I spend a hidden knowledge? Absolutely. I've got buckets of hidden knowledge. <laughs> so do I. Uh, I'm going to say the challenge for this is seven. Cool. Uh, what is the hidden knowledge do? Uh, it adds one to your roll, and you can spend a Bene on top of that if you like. 
Cool. Um, would that be an intellect? Yeah, this will be an intellect, Benny. Cool. I have a vex in that because of that Ooh. armor. Uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and uh, use that against you then. So if you spend a Benny, they'll even out. All right, cool. I'll spend I got a, a five. You got a five on a roll or total? Total. Okay. Three um, total for me. <laughs> how much? Three. All right. Just making sure. Um, so I will tell you. I added one. So e neither of you, I think, have spent enough time at um, uh, in Saturine to know precisely what this figure is. But I think there is something that um, moves down the back of your neck uh, and kind of uh, raises the hairs on it as I think both of you realize what this is in a general sense. Um, as you kind of look at it, um, I think you see kind of a shadow pass in front of it uh, over the court, over the alley, and suddenly it's gone. You realize whatever that was, it was an omen. And not a good one. Yeah, there's some uh, strange things up in the expense. On this. <laughs> I'd rather see the whatever creatures there are than the hate cysts, and there are many. Those are still around. Oh, yeah. Many? I don't think that really many people in the city know how to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. They're stuck here like mines. Anyway, with that wonderful introduction out of the way, uh, this has been uh, a recent home base, as it were. Uh, and she gestures to the uh, abandoned building that she's been using as a base. Not much on the outside, but I found the basement. Um, and she'll take you down into it. And that's when you'll see just the layout of like the uh, the start of an armory that's clearly being formed, the the wall that's like littered with uh, with with different district maps, uh, connecting strings, notes, uh, different different figures, uh, names that are represented across the board. Uh, what's predominant is the Deathless Triumvirate's name. Um, and uh, Gav walks over, snatches a paper, uh, a blank piece of paper off the board and uh, writes in uh, the... <laughs> um, my god, my brain is not functioning. Uh, the name of the people that we were killing in the war report. Uh, the, <laughs> the Vesper team. Thank you. I was about to call them something completely different. Um, uh, the vet and, like writes down Vesper team and then tacks it to the wall. Let me ask you something. Did you have to leave Fartown in order to get to this um, headquarters? Oh, yeah. It's the ruined expanse. She's uh, out of the city. Yeah. Well, it, it's outside of the city. Okay. Good point. We're in um, the unherbs. Uh, as I think that as you left, there is something that I think um, a feeling or a sensation that you weren't um, sure of or kind of like you were having a hard time putting your finger on it. Um, and then as you are in this dark, um, kind of cloistered basement, you realize that the indigo light that is flickering inside of your chest is now flickering brighter as Ooh. the power has recharged because you've moved out of once again another liminal space. As Fartown is essentially a universe that is cloistered from the rest of Saturn. Oh my god. Okay, so you're saying that the seed is active is active again. It is. Ah, oh, time makes no sense here. <laughs> Wait, does it make sense anywhere? Well, in theory. Only in theory. Only in theory. Um. Yeah, Gav uh, gestures around to like there's like a little bed that serves as uh the actual apartments. Uh, for the most part. I think like you're you're able to to just, this this looks like a base of operations. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah. I can imagine the various detritus, little you know, all of the stuff that you need to. Oh yeah. Uh, I'm yarn. Have you found yarn somewhere so you can make a crazy Charlie Day? Yeah, Pepe I've got Sylvia I've got the map. whole Pepe Sylvia vibe going on. 
Hardcore. Excellent. Excellent. Um, yeah, I think, think Okris just kind of um, seems to be appreciating the, the the choice of a ruined building as a um, as a base of operations. I what why exactly? Um, you just get a. I think that they're very hard to read, but you get almost almost a literal vibe. Um, in uh, in kind of like the charged air around them, like you know, it's just a general like kind of like game recognizes game. The triumvirate. When I first came to uh, the city, I was pretty convinced that none of this was in fact. If it was real, well, surely some things could be rearranged, taken down, I could return to where I came from, but from what I've seen now, I'm more convinced, or I, at least I was, that the Deathless Triumvirate had a hand in ensuring that everyone had forgotten their past. I did not know about the war when I was first brought here, um, but the more I found out about it, the more I've discovered that people had no recognition of fighting in it, nor did they know who their enemy was. This was suspicious to me, given that when I came here, I had come out of a war of my own. I didn't sit, it didn't sit right with me, and uh, it didn't sit right really with any of us, but I decided to uh, investigate, and the more I found out, the more I am convinced that this world is wrong. It calls itself the actuality, but it messes with reality more than I've ever seen. And after what I've seen in the war report, I do not know if my initial target was correct or if I was not entirely thinking, well, pointing in the right direction. I do not know if the Vespertine are also the Triumvirate, if there are members that are on the Triumvirate, or if the Vespertine pull the strings behind them, or if one does not know what the other hand is doing. But I'd like to figure it out. And I know Okris, at least the one that I saw in the war report, would also be very keen on destroying these people. I have to say I'm intrigued. <sighs> How long have they been called the Deathless? Do you have a name for any of them? No. What do they do? They rule the city. How? Uh, do you mean how, or do you mean when did they take over? Also a necessary question. My guess is sometime after the war. And war breeds power vacuums. That it does. We need to know who they are if you want their story to take a turn. Well, that's precisely what I've been trying to do. But with this, and she holds up her hand where the, the veins from the seed are glowing up towards her chest. I could ask and no. Um, with that, with that kind of, uh, that kind of, uh, show and tell, I guess, um, Okris, uh, kind of reaches into the uh, pocket and pulls out the multifaceted compass. It was Kieran's wish that I make you aware of this. What is it? Mm -hmm. Tech. <laughs> Leads to your... Desired hearts, amongst other things. Mm. I, can't, I can't, I can't with the fucking Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah, I keep thinking about it too. I just, I can't think about it. I'm just like, I'm trying to use it. Don't think about it, don't think about it, don't think about it. my heart. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. Um, you, so, uh, yeah. You guys wanted so many things and I needed to give you something. <laughs> All right, Captain Jack. Um, anyways. Uh, Gav raises a, an eyebrow at that. Captain Zack, thank you. Go ahead. Wow. It was just... 
<laughs> um, a tempting offer, but uh, I think right now it might be in multiple directions. There's a lot that I have just learned. I'm sort of being dropped into a lot of this. Uh, not that uh, far behind you. I knew your counterpart. Not well, but we did not get along. Well, that's one point in your favor, then. Hmm. I need somebody that is willing to fight. Curious. Hopefully still is. I have not fully told Maurice all of this. And now, with the Spider Prince, I'm not certain if I should. It's not because I do not trust him. Don't mistake me. It's mostly that it seems that we all have lives and memories that we ourselves are not entirely in control of. Whatever spell was cast to make this city forget its past. If we were to undo this, I do not know the Maurice we would get. I don't know how the spell worked. I don't know how they were able to make me sleep for so long. Kieran says we can trust Maurice, but... Where does your Maurice end and the spider prince begin is the real question. I would like to find that out. But that might require all of us. Which means you cannot go around killing my comrades. It's not his time anyways. Fair enough. I, I don't distrust you, Ocris. In a weird way, I uh, might trust you a bit more than some of the others, and that might have something to do with the whatever magic was in that report. But I know you are a good fighter, and right now I'm in desperate need of more people with that sensibility. There are so many people here that are warriors that do not remember. Soldiers that do not remember being soldiers, people that fought for something they do not remember fighting for. That does not sit well with me. Well, add to that, and I think that whoever runs this city used my people as a scapegoat for whatever power grab they wanted, and I would like to see them pay for that. And that is the threat, in case you are wondering. Ogre smiles with their eyes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, unless you guys have anything else, we will check yep. in on Marie. Oh, I do. Okay, go ahead. I'm not one for causes. I have my own motivations and my own needs. One of which is finding out where my counterpart did with certain internal organs. Where, what, why. I'll work with you. But I may need assistance in recovering things that are close to my chest. I can do that. Gav holds out a hand. Okris um, kind of stares at it for a second. And then like, and there's like literally like you can see the, the you can you can see the uh, the the processor bars <laughs> twirling or whatever. And then um, and uh, holds an uh, holds a hand out. Yeah, she clasps your arm, but like very suddenly, like yanks you forward. I'll tell you the same thing that I told Kiri. You need to find a cause, and eventually, 
<laughs> when our little contract is through, you can't just go around killing people. I want to try to make this city better. Whether or not I am a part of that, I do not know, but I see people that are distressed. And I will help them. Death is a cause. You are good at bringing it. Why don't you try bringing it for the right reasons now? Death is a state. And it's not the end. Not all of this. I never said it was the end. I do not believe death is an ending. But I didn't also say it was a beginning. It can be. I'll work oh. with you for now. Help me find the heart. And uh, there's definitely like kind of a, just a brief like tonal flutter when uh, they say the heart. Um, and we'll see where we are after that. Deal. Before we close on this scene, I would like you guys to make me a perception roll. Okay. Hashtag hate that. Um... I'm going to pop Ben into that. Okay. Yeah, same Z's. Great, but. Well, fuck me, right? <laughs> I so... rolled a three. <laughs> okay. You rolled a three? How'd you do? Zero plus one. Okay. Good job, team. <laughs> <laughs> I think that. Um... Something there's something about this that's very familiar to you, Gabrielle. Um, and th we'll leave it at that. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so uh, we are going to cut the scenes here and uh, Maurice, you are making your way through the cluster of cloisters, unless there is something else you want to do first. No, that's I. I, I take take my time getting there. I think Maurice is kind of looking at everything again for the first time, and even though there are many parts of Saturnine that fold in on themselves and are never the same the second time you look at them, he's still seeing things with in light of the knowledge that he has from the war report and and seeing as sometimes not sure if he's imagining or not um, what the place used to look like, what it was before the war and um, uses his disembodied face to kind of get vantage points that he, you know, would not be able to see before, kind of holding it like kind of like a puppet in his good, in his human hand. Um, and then walks to the Confederacy of Cloisters to see the statue of Nehran, and he wants to take it all in and see what he can see, see what strikes him as different, see what looks familiar, see what, what doesn't look familiar. Okay. So, I'm going to change to the path here, and I'm going to draw a couple of cards. One for, you know, when you entered, if anything special happened. Uh, this one is the Misunderstood Beast. Uh, its number is zero, it strengthens green magic, and it weakens pale. Its symbol is notions, cats, clocks, and wind. Its meanings are mistakes, gentleness, friendship, danger, and betrayal. The misunderstood beast is a gentle giant, not a murderous monster. It seeks our friendship, not our flesh. Can we see past its physical nature and ascertain its truth? Will we even try? Snap judgments can result in horrific mistakes. We judge something by its appearance or simply by the initial reaction it churns in our heart. But the real truth of a thing can rarely be ascertained so quickly. This misstep can catch us from either direction. We might judge something ugly as evil when it's not, 
or we might assume someone pleasant is a friend when they are not. Either way, we are harmed, or at least lessened, as a result. Something is not what it seems. This could be concealed threat that will result in betrayal, or it could be something useful that one is ignoring or even avoiding. The turn of this card warns of such mistakes, but the mistake might have already been made, and the misunderstood beast spells out the results of such a mistake. Often, this card suggests that one should look for aid from unexpected corners, but warily. In fact, what it really says is that if someone looks to be a friend, they are not, and those that seem to be a threat, likewise, are not. This is hard advice to take, and obviously, it's uh, not always true, only when this card is turned. Something perceived as a threat is no threat at all. A terrible danger hides in plain sight, appearing to be something benign or even beautiful. The fearsome need always not always be feared. So I'm going to take that one into account, and I'm going to turn another card. And this one is the driver. The defender of mysteries, rats, mirrors, and stone. Its value is seven, and its meanings are impetuous travel, forward motion, and speed. An NPC takes an important journey. Someone is in a terrible hurry. The impetuous decision that someone makes has huge ramifications for many others. The PC moves faster than normal in a cru crucial moment. An impetuous decision on the PC's part results in astonishing success. There is nowhere she cannot go if she is behind the wheel. So, as we kind of take that in, you try to look with eyes that you don't remember having at this place. And it's easy for you to picture in your mind's eye a place that is not suffused with wreckage, with the remains of a horrific calamity or conflict or war. It's simple to see where grass grew or where trees um, sprouted up in between each of the churches as they were built on, and places of worship as they were built on top of each other. You can see in your mind's eye hundreds, if not thousands of people trafficking through this district every day as opposed to the dozens that you see wandering the streets now. There was less of a dire air in this place, less doomsayers, less seers preaching repentance and the need for uh, us to accept the ruined expanse think it was overall a more hopeful place and in lieu of this memorial you could see a meadow a garden something celebrating the growth of life rather than its end and I think as you are trapped in this reverie for a moment can I ask you to make me a resistance roll level six yes what is my resistance? I get plus one to that. Okay. That's only a four. What moment of nostalgia comes unbidden to you in this moment of vulnerability? I think Maurice is actually thinking of the gray in this moment. He's thinking of a vacation he went on uh, by himself, the first vacation he took by himself, where he uh, took an old car up to a cabin to write his first novel. And the meadow that he was picturing in light of this statue is similar to the scene that he saw there. This wonderful, peaceful time of uh, self-assuredness and creativity. Uh, there is a moment where you have um, that nostalgia and you feel almost the color leaching out of it and then you hear a yeah as something gets yanked off of you um and behind you you see um a figure that is familiar to you um a brawn a uh 
maker of uh, that you recognize. And I think in this moment, you have this unsettling experience of looking at somebody uh, who you used to know prior to what they uh, did in the change race. Uh, so at one point, they um, had been a youngish man, uh, probably mid uh, to early 30s when you knew them. Uh, they uh, were very able-bodied. You watched them through Kieran's eyes age into um, just a, a horrifying kind of mangle of times and temporal displacement. Um, and now you see them as probably a result of their ex uh, his experiences during the world uh, war uh, as a mishmash of kind of these ramparts, miniature in size, but large enough to um, replace the whole of his torso, uh, as well as kind of these constellations of um, cannons uh, over on one side, as you realize that he has changed himself to better defend himself uh, from any possible avenues of attack. Uh, and he is holding in his hand a uh, flopping, twisting, gray eel of uh, some sort, and he uh, very quickly smashes it against the ground uh, and uh, un continues until it stops moving. And uh, he looks at you and says, I'm sorry, friend, I I spotted this. Uh, it seemed to have attached itself to you. That's a choice. And he's uh, looking at your lack of a face. Uh, Maurice brings up his face and, and puts it back on and says, uh, thank you very much. What? What is that? Uh, and he pulls it up and he looks, uh, oh, I believe this is a memory eel. Uh, uh, it tends to elicit strong memories in people so that it can feed on them. Um, Maurice reaches out to grab it with his tentacle arm. Yeah, uh, and you do this, and it is, um, I don't think it is alive anymore, as, uh, uh, I believe, um, Abron has smashed it very well. Um, what do you do with it? Uh, Maurice just inspects it, and then, uh, kind of looks back to Abron and says, I imagine they do very well at memorials and other places like this. Uh, too right, unfortunately. Uh, can... Thank you very much, friend. Absolutely. Uh, it's a surprise to see you again. I was hoping you'd remember me. It's been a minute. Uh, it's been some time, but uh, old soldiers, we have our haunts, as it were. Indeed we do. How are you these days? How's, uh, how's time treating you? Well, as much as an old soldier can expect. My limp hasn't gone away, but uh, that's another change we visit at some point. Do you ever... Do you ever miss taking orders? Do you, I sometimes find it to be a burden to be responsible all by myself. Oh, absolutely. I could have somebody take over everything for me. I don't have to think about anything. Where to go, where to sleep, where to eat, what to eat. Yeah, maybe a tailor. Uh, yeah, what, I, it's not a comment on my duds. And he um, gestures towards the suit that is underlaid over uh, his uh, torso somewhat awkwardly. Uh, as uh, And you realize that this conversation you're having is with seemingly a normal volume voice of a soldier speaking out uh, the uh, one of the parapets of this fortress that makes up his torso. Not at all, not at all. You look very safe. Um, no, I, I was talking about who you used to take orders from. The and, tailor. Uh, this, you, I think you see the... Um, the man on the rampart kind of cock its head very microscopically. Um, can you make me a um, interaction roll? Sure. And I do have a, a vex to this, both for the suit and the tentacle arm. Uh, I'm going to use one. Okay. So you feel free to use uh, uh, your uh, expansive endeavor as well. I will use both of those. So 
net plus one, and that's a two. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think um, you don't know for sure if he's putting on an act for you or if he just legitimately doesn't know mm -hmm. who you're talking about. But he doesn't register any kind of recognition. Forgive me, I... <laughs> Old minds. Oh. Sometimes we don't have control over what goes through them. Oh, I know that all too well. So, um, can I interest you in lunch? Maybe a drink nearby, or...? Oh, I'll have to take a rain check on that, I'm afraid. I just wanted to take another look. It is... It's been it's... a minute. Yeah. It is something, isn't it? And he's looking at this um, magnanimous-looking uh, sculpture. And I think the interesting thing about uh, the sculpture that you've seen is it it has, you know, I think the bronze of it has oxidized a little bit over time, as many kind of um, sculptures would typically do. But um, I think that there, the sculpture, as you look at it more studiously, I think it's abstract in that it is showing only kind of the uh, contours of the outline, so to speak, uh, or patches of skin uh, and uh, kind of regalia where a body is implied. And um, the only thing that seems to be kind of fully uh, fleshed out into a 3D sculpture is the face and head of... Um, of Neheran, and as you look, Neheran is perfectly represented, uncannily so, and from all of this oxidizing bronze sculpture, um, profusely especially from the eyes, it seems like water is dripping down, as if the um, sculpture itself is shedding tears. Remind me, I, I know I asked you last time. Do, do you remember Neheran? I'm going to turn a card to see just how much he remembers. <laughs> Lucky coin. Good fortune. Wealth. Freedom. Unexpected luck. A group of wild unfairness involved in matters at hand. He succeeds at what they attempt to an even greater degree than they thought possible. The PC gets an unexpected windfall. The PC or an NPC ally gets free of something that fetters them. And I think in this moment, there is kind of like a clarity that falls over a bronze face as if you ask the right question. Oh. I remember Neheran being resolute, being devoted to us, to this city, to wanting all of us to come home, to make it back in one piece. He was singular and powerful and inspiring, I think. I think that's why I don't regret going to war, even if, well, the results speak for themselves. The results may speak for themselves, but, and he claps him on the shoulder or on the parapet <laughs> and says, but we can speak too. Neheran was a singular individual, but he was buoyed by the strength of those underneath him. People like you, I think, you have a great work left in you. And if you haven't been to Far Town, stop into the Acclamation Center, the Hendasa Acclamation Center. Who knows what you might find? I I'm terribly sorry, I, I do have to run, but it, it was so good to see you. And may Vizsla shine her face on you. Thank you. I had to do the same on you. And I think that uh, as you leave him, there is a 
pause and a reflective thought crosses um, the face of uh, his guardsman on that parapet. So small, you can barely see it. Maurice is off to... Uh, actually, he, he he rounds the corner. He walks away from the, the statue and then thinks for a moment and looks around. What does it look like on the outskirts of the cloisters? On the outskirts of the cloisters, I think that you see a great deal of... Um, some of the choke of the um, ruined expanse, but um, if I can refer to my map at some point. Uh, I think that, uh, yeah, I think you see several other districts just need to find the primary map. But yes, um, what are you looking for, I should ask? So, like, what, what is, what's the general, like, like are there, are there Doors and stalls? Are there, is it residential? Is it abandoned? Is it industrial? I think there's a great number of uh, residences of, uh, partic particularly of clergy, um, for uh, any of the uh, numerous uh, religious institutions dotting the Confederacy of Cloisters. Um, and I think that if you want anything that is specific to a store or a stall, is going to uh, uh, provide religious icons of some sort mm. or any kind of other religious offering. Um, Maurice makes his way to um, where was Kenroy's uh, ashram? Uh, I think Kenroy's ashram yeah, I think it was a little bit on the outskirts there if you would like to make your way there. Sure. Uh, that's where Maurice is heading next. Okay. Uh, so, uh, does anybody have any other, uh, things they want to accomplish, uh, before we rejoin the rest of that scene, or would you guys like to, um, let that play out? Okay. Uh, go ahead. You make your way to Kenroy's ashram. What are you looking for? Um, I'm looking for Kenroy, and Maurice kind of trepidatiously steps into the grounds and walks up to the interior of the of the residence okay so i need to find something right quick that quick um so as you wander into the ashram uh which is being attended by several um lower level weavers who i think some of them are recognize you but it doesn't cross them how long you've been away. Um, however, there is one person uh, who uh, you recognize um, after a quick greeting. A woman's voice uh, speaks up from the middle of the ashram as you've kind of entered and says, Oh, Kenroy said you'd be here. He just was wrong about the timing. And you recognize Idora, one of the weavers of your cell, who was there when you first attained the first degree. How have you been, Maurice? I don't quite know how to answer that question. How are you, Idora? Uh, and she doesn't wait uh, for anything. She moves forward to give you this great embrace. Maurice returns it. Um, she has tice, uh, tight, closely cropped hair. Um, her uh, dark skin uh, she has mounted over um, her figure uh, kind of this very odd looking um, uh, kind of linen uh, garment that kind of swoops out almost like a wingspan of some uh, like a flying squirrel of something um, it's beautiful and it's decked on either and it's kind of um, punctuated on either side by these kind of brass um, bangles uh, uh, as uh, she kind of steps back and kind of almost take you in entirely. You remember when we used to eat pie together and not have a care in the world? I would very much like to go back to those days. And she says, well, come in. Let's talk. It's been a while. It has. I, I'm afraid I can't stay very long. Is Kenroy here? So no one's told you. It's been a while. 
So, um, Kenroy and Master Rajothmos, they left some time ago on a journey. Um, they traveled to the Sea of Abstraction. Um, I think something about going to a half-world to find another piece of research, but nobody's seen either of them since. I uh, No, I do recall that that was the goal. What research, what were they working on exactly? <sighs> well, Rajathmos, I think, wanted to continue um, Kenroy's training, and in order to do so, I think that he wanted to help him find him a new aggregate. I believe it was the infinity aggregate. He wanted to help him to embrace more of those higher understandings. At least that's what I, what Kenroy told me. Thank you. I um, don't suppose they left any way of contacting them or. Well, um, I think there was a means by which I tried to get in touch, but it's no one's replied to it. Uh, and um, she gives you, uh, she kind of uh, leads you into um, the kitchen, um, where on one table uh, off to the side, kind of collecting dust, is you see um, an old timey radio. Um, very much kind of like akin to something you might have seen uh, uh, from the 1950s, uh, ostensibly in uh, the Museum of the Lie, uh, whatever kind of passes for that abstract concept there. Um, and she says, well, this is a spirit radio, but it's been tuned um, to specifically look for someone. And you can usually get somebody to answer a question when you tune it to their frequency or you make the request of it, but no one has responded, neither Rajathmos nor Maurice, or to Kenroy. I, is this common knowledge? Are people worried? Is there a search party? How, how long has it been? Well, it's been several months. Um, communications were fairly frequent. Occasionally we would get a letter. Um, I am of course, um, kind of running the ashram while the two of them are absent, but... Yeah, and you're doing quite a fine job. It looks great. How would you know? <laughs> she just kind of, like, uh, gives a smirk. You haven't been here either. Actually, that was the next thing I wanted to talk to you about. Um, I'm a little bit fuzzy on the circumstances of my departure. Uh, I also think I left a few things here. Uh, what do you know? Oh, I... I, I only know what everybody tells me. Um, why? Is there something you need to pick up? Um, my typewriter, if it's still here. Oh, yeah, I don't think we ever really kind of changed your room. I mean, we still have other students and guests, but I don't think anybody's moved in permanently. It's more for visitors. I had a student I was teaching, um, Mac. Um, where, where did he go? Well, I tried to teach Mac best as I could, but, um, when you were gone for quite some time, um, I think, uh, I didn't know he was your student. He just mentioned that his teacher was doing something very important and, uh, couldn't be disturbed. He always had this strange gentleman about with him, um, Somebody had always seemed like he knew everything that about you, and he would always tell you at length without, you know, being prompted. Maurice gives a head-to-toe description. Was it that guy? Oh, yes. Um, That's right. Basil. That was his name. Yeah. He hasn't been around since Mac left, I take it? No. I think um, they seem to have this kind of long conversation, and then um, Mac said that... Um, he had some searching to do, and then, um, Basil, I believe that gentleman left not too long after, and, um, I think may have left you something. I, I don't know. I think, I, I think he was the only person that stayed in your room. Thank you. Um, last question. Yes. 
Do you have any food I can take with me? Are you hungry for pie? Pie will do. In a to-go container, if you don't mind. Oh, absolutely. And, um, and Idora gets to work. Um, and I think that this kind of represents the end of, like, the first day for all of you during this period of downtime. You still... Uh, can I do one more thing before, uh, as I'm getting home? Absolutely. What would you like to do? Um, where, first of all, where is my house now? Where is your house? I believe it was in Fartown where last we checked. Where last we checked. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe uh, as Maurice leaves the ashram, it, it's getting quite late. And uh, and the ashram is where again? Is it uh, Topiary? Uh, the ashram is on the outskirts of Confederacy of Cloisters, I believe, is where we... Oh, it is? Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, I could be wrong. We might need to retcon that. But sure. go ahead. Yeah, wherever that is. Um, Maurice, um, it's getting dark. And a, a look of determination crosses his face, and he looks and finds a place nearby that has a decent amount of foot traffic, but isn't in the middle of everything. And squints and shimmering into existence, his apartment building appears as he spends the acumen for the house secret. Yeah. Absolutely. And he looks quite pleased with himself. And as he walks in the front door, he takes out the pie and starts whistling um, and looking for the real life dog that has taken residence in his home. Uh, the watchdog uh, appears not too long after. Uh, and again, it uh, in the eerie light uh, of... I think a couple of them, as you kind of flick them on going into the apartment building again, that eerie large shadow is cast behind the dog and it woofs at you, not in a generally friendly way, but in one that's like, ah, you're here kind of tone. And it's like, sorry, I was gone so long, and I know this isn't good for dogs, but here, and kind of slides the pie across the floor. And the dog looks up, looks down at the pie, looks up at you, and then just darts into uh, its uh, muzzle into the pie and begins uh, really kind of having at it. And I think at this point, Maurice finally looks over to see uh, shadow form Duncan, who, if a dog could look jealous, has that look on his face. And uh, oh. Maurice scoops scoops him up and says, all right, boy, and then walks in and sits down on his recliner. And that's the scene. Excellent. All right. I'm going to turn off the music there. So that is the first day of your week of downtime. Um, if anybody, would we like to kind of fast forward any days or is there more that everybody wants to get accomplished or would you like to go to the oblong chamber directly? What's everybody's intent? Gav is good. Gav gathered up the rest of her equipment that she needed and uh, I think just scrawled a note uh, for <laughs> uh, the rebel angel that A, she's alive, the circumstances, and if they're still poking around the uh, place of operations, this is what's going down. Absolutely. And if you have any um, magic that um, can transmit a message, you can try to do that. Alas, I do not have that. We're going to have to be old fashioned. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Find people and scream at them. <laughs> you! <laughs> um, I, I think Maurice wanted to meet up with um ashwin mm -hmm. that could probably be a side scene okay. um but uh every night uh maurice uh triggers the dream study mm -hmm. uh to the point of his own detriment if you do it two nights in a row you begin to take uh damage mm -hmm. i believe it's ang anguish um and he does so uh every night with the hopes of seeing Kiri in the dream study. And Kiri, how does that time pass for you? Kiri doesn't come. Um, not yet. Anyway, um, 
I had a question for you, Zach, just on the tail end of like the wrapping up the scene with Zaleska. Um, what did Kiri learn about the murders at the Vantian campus? Like whether there's been suspects, who in fact was murdered? Okay. Yeah, I will go ahead and kind of summarize that here. Um, so you found that uh, a lot of the people that were being murdered were low-level postulants, as well as uh, several, um, I want to say, magistrates. Uh, one of the people that has gone missing, uh, who may not, who was remains have not been found, and also it, these murders were particularly uh, noisome to a lot of the Telmeric Council or court rather, uh, because of the wards and um, uh, basically the protections that are in place on uh, the campus, uh, leading everyone to kind of wonder essentially how safe and secure the um, campus is as of uh, the time being. Um, one of the people that kind of uh, spearheaded um, this question was Ota Clasp, uh, a, um, uh, a magus uh, who uh, eventually would succeed and take um, on the title of Supreme Magus and replace uh, Yadavastra after a vote of no confidence. Um, one of the people that is missing is Alinea, who um, you find out reported directly to Yadarastra before. Um, what else do you, is there anything else that you try to find out? Yes, um, I think, Oleg, or sorry, Kiri wants to know um, how safe is the Vantian campus or is it currently like in a state of lockdown? Uh, it is fairly locked down. Um, you have the feel uh, a feeling that um, so they they basically assembled a Telmeric council. It's been nine months. Uh, so far, there doesn't seem to be any plans to cancel the Council of Yov, but mm -hmm. you don't know uh, if it's going to be open to anyone beyond the Vance, depending on uh, Ota's uh, choice or leadership. Does Kiri get the impression from Yadavastra that it could be dangerous for her to go back to the Vance? Uh, I don't think you do. I think that okay. she seems to think that you are in, um, you are okay. Okay. To go back. Okay. Um, so when we go back to the Oblong Chamber, that kind of is, is the point of departure to the Silver Sun. Is it that? Is. Okay. It is. Um, before that happens... Uh, there's at least one thing Kiri would like to do, um, and that is Kiri would like to visit Twig's house. Okay. Um, all right. So you begin traveling to the Topiary District to the place that was not uh, long after your visit, um, or not long before y'all's last visit, uh, Ruined Expanse, and I am going to change the music all right so you have headed into the topiary district you have fallen uh followed all of the um uh the kind of the points uh at which you can uh remember for um kind of points of interest and kind of uh, uh monuments or guide posts for you um and you are where you remember this kind of semi-vacant lot and this silver sapling to be. And it does not look like that anymore. That vacant lot is festooned with growth on growth on growth of uh, trees, so much so and, and, and vegetative growth and different species of all kinds of trees and uh, shrub. And not only that, um, it reminds you uh, in some ways of ivy or kudzu, but it's more like kind of like Japanese knotgrass in some places. Just stuff that it just seems is so rapacious um, that it doesn't necessarily uh, uh, seem to have any kind of like way to kind of peer through this solid wall of vegetation. I would like you to make me a perception roll as you kind of take this scene in. Lovely, yes. Um, I will add a bene to this. And that's a seven, so eight. Okay. So as you are looking around and kind of like looking for a way in, 
uh, you notice that there are some discarded um, con like construction equipment, some broken implements of some sort. Uh, it very much kind of reminds you a little bit of what I think you learned about when you were first investigating this area of the ruined expanse for um, uh, for infiltration of like the uh, Lunarian Opera House, or at least that's what I think Gabrielle would have told you guys about. I think Kiri will look at this mass of knotted vines and plants, um, and she'll call out, "Fix up! And Fix up! Can you hear me?" And there is movement in the brush. You hear the cracking of limbs and branches. Um, Ochris. Well, not specifically Ochris. This is more twig and or hopper. Um, what was, uh, what species of shrub or tree was um, fix up before? Fix up was a juniper tree. Okay. Which is often very low and shrubby, but um, can not be. My question is how much would uh, Fix Up have grown in about a year? A little bird just reminded me that Fix Up was sage, not juniper, another delightful <laughs> herb, which is a low plant and not in fact a tree. Okay, all right. So Fix Up was a sage plant. Um, excellent. So as these um, things crack, and I'm actually going to uh, take another card just to make sure. I'll go ahead and see how we do. This is going to end on the Testament of Sons. Ooh. The Blind Guardian. Uh, it's... What the fuck, it, Bonnie Cook? <laughs> It strengthens silver magic and it weakens gold. Vision, swans, blades, and water. Safety, impartiality, severity, blindness, and challenges. The blind guardian watches over us like a protector. That's probably our door it guards. Because of its blindness, it confronts all intruders equally. From the lowest vermin to the most powerful god. From the purest angel to the vilest demon. Its blindness also confers a calmness. You'll never see the guardian worry or fret nor will you see it eager or anticipatory. To those that seek what it guards, it is difficult to challenge. It is a difficult challenge. You cannot bribe or charm this guardian, and despite its blindness or because of it, it is very difficult to fool or deceive. Although it can represent a challenge arising before one can proceed, typically this card is a positive turn, indicating safety or serenity. If some sort of authority figure or any judgment at all is involved, this card indicates that they can be counted on to be impartial. Rarely, it suggests literal blindness is involved. Uh, an endangered person or place remains safe. An authority makes an impartial and fair ruling. A challenge arises with an obvious reward if it over is overcome. Crouching before the door, the guardian does not judge, only protects. Okay. And I think... You were expecting this small sage plant. And you do see a small sage plant growing out of the trunk of a massive tree. Uh, it seems to have these fairly large, uh, about, let's say, this uh, length around limbs uh, that kind of are elongated and long. It seems to crouch under the brush of this as uh, it looks to confront you. Uh, and it has like this consternated look on its small shrub face in the heart of this hollowed out kind of carapace that it has grown around itself. Um, moss and lichen kind of coming kind of festooning out of the joints. Uh, and it looks at you and there is this kind of, I think, it sounded like there would be a angry grumble that suddenly changes mid tone as it goes. Kiri, Kiri runs at fix up <laughs> and throws her arms around its trunk. 
And then, yeah, I think that even as large as this thing is now, it's probably about six and a half feet tall. It kind of like almost kind of steps back out of surprise and then Huey, and begins to kind of like move down to embrace. Um, just past it, you see through this hollow that is kind of carved through a large silver tree that you used to remember was a sapling. Kiri will extend her hand as she has done to fix up so many times before uh, to greet them, despite having hugged its trunk first um, in a sort of gesture of remembrance and nostalgia. Yeah, and I think at that point, it kind of, all these joints kind of fold over yours very carefully. I think a smile brightens Kiri's face um, and she gestures over to the silver tree, um, the tall silver tree, and and beckons Fix Up follow her there. Okay, and it does, and I think um, you see that there, I think as you are kind of following it through this underbrush, just how difficult it is to step through, and I think uh, there are po points where Fix Up lays an arm down uh and kind of like provides like a small walkway for you where necessary but as you are making through with that perception roll you do recognize there are more of these discarded implements um there are sometimes it seems like shreds of clothing uh torn on brambles as if and then you see that there are dots of blood not very large kind of um uh, expenditures of blood that have like since turned brown and caked uh, kind of uh, with age um, that are uh, kind of scattered throughout some of these areas of the brush. Um, you take all of this in as you make your way to the silver tree. What do you do? Um, Kiri looks at the base of the silver tree. Are there pale seeds there? Oh, yes. Or what have they become? Oh, I think that, I think that the silver tree itself uh, does not actually have um, gray, pale seeds growing off of it, but all surrounding it are uh, pale seed plants, pale plants essentially, uh, with some of those skull-like pods uh, coming off of it. It's almost as if that uh, they're poking up through the roots of this silver tree. And Curie and approaches the base of the tree. Oh, God. Yeah. I was going to say, I, I, when I say silver, by the way, it is the, the trunk is solid metallic silver. Um, the leaves, you can kind of see um, the, uh, I think there's almost, it's almost very fine, like a uh, silver leaf uh, that have these kind of spiraling circulatory systems of solid silver. Um, and yes, as you kind of reach forward, what do you do? Um, Kiri comes to the base of the silver tree and stands looking up at its wide, leafy branches. Um, and I think she reaches for a piece of fix-up to, like, hold a branch of theirs, something that's at the level of her hand, um, to maintain that connection. And yeah. she says, I keep thinking of the moment that Twig and I first came here. You know how you remember the strangest details about moments that you replay over in your head? How time slows and you want to hold on to everything, but the details fade and you feel their loss, the empty space that they leave behind? Oh. I was furious with Twig, you know. I thought that, well, they thought that they could control my magic and send everyone to where they felt safe. <laughs> they were an arrogant asshole. But I wouldn't let them. I resisted. And the next thing I knew, I smelled ash and asphalt baking in the sun and salt because Twig was crying at this very tree. Do you remember that fix up? I do. 
And now the air smells like vegetation and sprawling, blossoming, wild growth. And all I can think of is the way that when Twig found me in their house, this unlikely intruder with a gun and you, just a, si a tiny shrub then, how they laughed, how the corners of their eyes crinkled up, quizzical and skeptical and caught off guard, and how they looked almost happy. Fix Up has taken a knee. Uh, and its sage face and its kind of like ring of this trunk is surrounding that same expression and it's looking deeply at you, wrapped listening to your words. Kiri's tone of address changes as if she were speaking to Twig. I have all these pieces of you all these things that you made, that you left behind. I keep getting flashes, Fortinbras in your hand, the pale seeds as you stuffed them into your grubby pocket, that, that disgusting overcoat, the gentleness you had as you scritched literalum under the chin and tussled Fixup's tendrils, and she gestures to Fixup's now wide canopy. And now they're here and they're looking to me and I can't, I'm not a caregiver. I'm not, I'm not you. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go and you're gone. I don't know who I am anymore. And you've always managed to see that so clearly. You told me that the Vance, the campus, was a cage, and so I flew free. But now it hurts, and all I want is to go home, to go back to where my knowledge means something, where I know my way around and I'm useful. I need a new beginning, and, well, that's what you're good at. And the worst of it is, I tried to save you, and all I managed to do was to bring them that creature out of you, like a rabbit out of a hat. What a fool magician I am. I failed you, Twig, and I am so, so sorry. And I need to turn a card. <sighs> the compelling voice. The color is invisible. Secrets, ravens, books, and flame, its meanings are control and domination and persuasion. The right voice can command an army. In word or song, the compelling voice bids us to do something we might not do otherwise. It moves us, frightens us, appeals to our sense of reason. Those who master such a technology, uh, such a technique, have a weapon in their arsenal equal to any other. Because the Secrets family is related to books, however, it's worth considering that the voice in question might actually come in the form of a written message. The speaker might be an author instead. Mostly, however, compelling voice is considered to be the outsider of the Secrets family. The domination or persuasion inherent in compelling voice can be used both by and against the person in question. It can be a warning to beware honeyed words, or that someone you trust or interact with is actually being controlled by someone else. Alternatively, it can mean that you must use some persuasion to get what you want or need. An NPC uses influence over another to change a situation. Joy. An NPC listens to the PC's words and does as asked. We follow the voice. We are compelled by the words. There is a light that you see bathe Fix Up's face. And I think Fix Up, who was looking very sad, almost like a goldfish, its memory 
evaporates as it says, Ooh, pretty. And there's something else. As you understand the words and you use them, they travel very far to a distant place in the actuality. Twig, as you are walking through this dense forest, you hear the loving and admiring words of a friend reach your ears. And you turn as if to listen to where they came from. And you look at your companion who is following closely behind you. And for a moment, you think you recognize their face. But when you turn back, memory eludes you. Oh, is everything all right? I thought I heard something. Did, did, did you hear that too? Yes. Somebody who cares very much about you. We should make sure that you get back, shouldn't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no use waiting then. Carry on. And you feel their hand gently try to push you forward. I may add one final detail. As Kiri drops to her knees and watches the tears drip off her nose into the dirt, a distant memory chimes like the sun storming over the horizon at the break of day as she remembers Fregeleva's tears falling onto rolling hills, a silver flower with touches of blue illustrated in the pages of a book. A book here, a book that said, it is said that these tulips have transformative curative properties. And the legends say it can be found in the silver sun. And Kiri stands the light of comprehension dawning, resolve, burning in her eyes, her hand tight on fix up tendril. And what Twig would see if they looked at the horizon in their mind forest is a beacon set alight, burning in an endless forest to call them out of the dark. And on that note, we will end our session. Guys, thank so you. So good, Marissa. <laughs> Marissa, so good. Well done. So, uh, guys, um, this has been a uh, pretty kind of low-key, but very, I think, very important episode. Um, I'm going to just try to keep this brief. I asked everybody, we're just going to do five-minute character recaps, um, and we'll go ahead and start with Marcy. Or not Marcy, um, Gabrielle. Uh, yeah, um, I, I think... Do you get a point of joy just for for not having done anything horrible? I think so. I think I think that's good. But also, you got a new ally, or you know, an ally of convenience. That's worth some joy, right? Yeah, I think so. Uh, take that, and I think also, um, I think remembering kind of the reason, finding your your home again, um, and also witnessing that omen together with somebody. Uh, go ahead and take that acumen as well. Did any um, character arcs transpire? No. Okay, cool. Uh, Maurice. Um, I think Maurice, uh, overall, it's a joy. Uh, he is doing what he needs to do. Um, he knows that the you know, road ahead is going to be tough and, and that his team is not doing well. Um, but there are others that he needs to take care of and he's taking steps to do that. So I think that's a joy. 
Awesome. Take one joy and then uh, take an acumen for uh, finding out a little bit more about where uh, Kenroy is and also about uh, where Mac may have kind of taken off for. So um, moving on over. Oh, Chris. I think we might have actually got managed to get a point squeeze a point of joy out of you boy um, and uh like blood from a stone a really really irritated stone um uh overall this is technically the so um they've started the first step to finding their grubby little heart um and also kind of um, made a compact with Gavrielle um, to begin the first step on this journey towards the, you know, the end of the Deathless Triumvirate, which is, and the first step uh, is the first step towards the end. So I think that's, um, that's uh, that, that brings them a sense of purpose that is often lacking excellent so take one for the uh, uh one joy for uh this new alliance and for that first step uh in addition to that uh take one acumen for uh i believe it's one acumen for the first step on the character arc i'll correct that to make sure take one acumen as well for um sharing that uh kind of experience with gabrielle uh and finally uh Kiri. I think Kiri gets a joy. Excellent. I think, I think that for the first time in a while, um, this episode was very cathartic in many ways for Kiri. Um, and I think between the scene with Yadavastra, where someone from her order sort of told her, Zaleska, if Zaleska didn't entrust this thing to you, I, you know, I would have i don't you know it, you are such a competent guardian of knowledge you know that even if zaleska had her reasons the fans are not infallible i think that was an important thing for her to hear even if she can't quite believe it yet um and then i think there was a lot of catharsis in this moment at twig's house um in terms of trying to reconnect to whatever is left of twig um because of course as we know she could tell okris was lying when okris said that they couldn't communicate with Twig, and Okris had previously said that Twig isn't dead. Um, and so, I mean, I think Kiri sort of, she, much like with, with her Maleficence and her raw emotional energy, that was her kind of the best attempt she could have to reach Twig. And I think now that she has remembered this about the, the god's tulips, she has a reason, a guiding light um, to go to the Silver Sun. Excellent. So take one joy. Did any tra uh, character arcs transpire as well? No, not any uh, as of yet. Uh, so take a point of acumen as you determined. Um, not only did you make these kind of revelations, um, you have found a way forward after uh, reconnecting to something that came from a happier time. So. Can I uh, ask one thing? Because I think I, I skipped past something. Um, what was it that Basil left for Maurice at the ashram? Uh, a typewritten letter waiting in your typewriter, which Great. I will um, give for you to read at a later time. Great. Cool. Um, so I am going to go ahead. We're going to just uh, jump right into shout outs uh, very briefly. Uh, Marcy, shout outs, uh, plugs for this week. Yeah, um, well, as you all know by now, I have to plug our Flights of Fandom show, which is on every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and if you're not already sick of myself, Hopper, or Zach, uh, definitely tune in this week uh, as we finish up a really fun two-parter uh, set in the Firefly universe. Uh, it's going to get super wild. Uh, we have to fight some Reavers. And obviously, you want to see that happen. So tune in Tuesday, 8 p.m., I uh, hope to see you there. Yep. Can't wait. Um, Bill, shout out, Splugs. 
uh, let's see. I guess I will have the honor of announcing on this stream that friend of the show, Jeff Stormer, is now any winning friend of the show, Jeff Stormer, uh, for won the best uh, Game Master Award for Party of One. So if you haven't checked out Party of One, maybe see how the best there is can do it. Uh, other friends of the show I'd like to shout out is Encounter Party. Uh, big things on the horizon from them coming very soon. Excellent. Uh, Hopper, shout outs and plugs. Well, fuck. Um, <laughs> that was, uh, everybody covered all my important shit. On a, um, I guess it's September. Um, I'd like to remind everybody that during September, uh, it is at least in the U.S., it is the National um, Suicide Awareness and or Prevention Month. And uh, shit be tough. Uh, it's hard shit's life's hard fuck it's really hard and uh sorry um <laughs> uh that's just my personal commentary you don't need to take that that's not the takeaway the takeaway is that you should reach out to the people that you care about and the people that make your life um good and bring you joy and make sure that they're okay and sometimes we drift away from people and and that's a natural thing but it's also okay to just reach out and be like sup fucker <laughs> love you um and little things like that like just being aware of the people in your life and taking that moment of empathy don't just help them they help us be more connected to the people around us and that's really what life's about so um take some time tell the people you love you love them and uh don't be a nazi there we go absolutely a, a truer words never spoken um Finally, Marissa, shout outs, plugs. Um, just one, uh, echoing all of that. Um, the lovely folks who brought to, uh, the game Good Society to you, Story Brewers Role Playing, have just launched their new Kickstarter for a game called Fight with Spirit, uh, which is a collaborative TTRPG about a sports team growing up together and fighting for their passion. Um, so in this game, you hone your skills, face down rivals, and strive to take your team to the national championships. And along the way, of course, as with any Story Brewers Role Playing game, you explore friendships, feelings, and the fleeting nature of your time together. Um, and and so literally it is a game that can be about any sport. Um, it's designed for most, uh, you know, like a team versus a team type sport. Um, but some of the unlockables for the Kickstarter are uh, ways to tailor it to both individual sports and asynchronous sports um, so that you can tell these stories really with any sport you want. So go check that out if that sounds great to you. Um, Story Brewers Role Playing, lovely group of people. Please support them in any way you can. Excellent. Um... So I have a couple shout outs. Um, first off, I would like to do something I neglected to do on the past uh, episode of Flights of Fandom and plug um, David Brunel Brutman's uh, game In the Dark, uh, which we have been using as an engine and uh, which he just released on his itch for uh, purchase uh, according to whatever price you want. Uh, he has done an amazing job and uh, released, I believe, four play sets to go with it. Uh, we are currently using a custom play so set called In the Ver Into the Verse, uh, which is our own kind of Firefly-themed one. Uh, so he's done a tremendous amount of work. You should patronize him and check out his other uh, really great games uh, called uh, at the itch called DBB. Uh, hyphen eight dot itch dot io. So check that out. I think uh, he really deserves uh, more attention than he's getting because he's pretty awesome. Um, second shout out is going to be to uh, Angel Citadel. So guys, thanks so much for uh, joining us, Angel Citadel, Josh Fesnarax, the fantastic. Thank you for your bits. Um, all of our regulars, but uh, especially to Angel Citadel, but just because we are getting to share the collective experience of Invisible Sundays with them going forward. And in 20 minutes, I believe Josh and uh, perhaps Joanne or uh, just Josh are going to be sitting down to take audience questions and to discuss uh, Kickstarters in the lounge of Angel Citadel. So uh, check that out. I uh, have a really cool... Uh, oh, and Joanne is joining. So... Uh, have a really cool, uh, slow, uh, uh, kind of like nice discussion about, uh, cool TTRPGs and stuff that we're seeing in the Kickstarter space. Um, for my own, I just want to say, um, 
you know, I love these moments that we get to share um, amongst ourselves, both as a cast and with you guys who are watching. Um, it's kind of an odd space to be in when we're kind of performing for an audience, but I don't think that that makes those moments any less powerful or significant. Uh, and, you know, I'm always kind of a little bit um, moved and a little bit flabbergasted by um, what beautiful things you guys bring to this game. And it makes me tear up when um, you guys just do just amazing stuff. So thank you so much for letting me enjoy that and letting me be a part of that. Um, so anyhow, before I completely lose it, um, I am going to say good night, and I wish the best for all of you and for all of your friends, and I am going to echo uh, Hopper's sentiments about um, taking care of the ones you love, uh, and I hope most of all that the invisible sun shines on you all, and uh, finally also don't be a Nazi. Don't ever do it. Why would you? Anyway, uh, we love you. Have a good night. Take care.